Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope y'all are doing well. Today we're going to design a map navigation app similar to Google Maps. At first, we're going to take a look at the high level features of the app. Then we're going to come up with a high level design. And finally, we're going to dive deeper into some of the technical details. So with that being said, let's start with the high level features. So of course, the user should be able to input the destination that they want to go to. Once we get the destination, we should generate a few possible routes that the user can take to reach their destination. The routes should be ranked from fastest to slowest, and they should also take into account any user preference. As the user starts moving towards the destination, we should be able to track the user's location in real time and give them any direction when appropriate. We should also be able to inform the user in real time whenever there is any change to either traffic or road conditions on their way. So those are going to be the high level features. Now, keeping these in mind, let's start with our high level design. Okay, so this is how the high level system is going to look like. Let's go step by step to see how do we actually generate the routes to the user. So in step one, the user is going to input the location on their phone. This is going to be just a text. Whenever the user uh, inputs the location and hits enter or just submits the, submits the form, the client or the phone is going to make a HTTP call to our navigation service which is going to be the first backend service that the client is calling. The navigation service is going to call the geocoding service to get the latitude and longitude associated with the address that the user just input. Once the navigation service has the latitude and longitude, it's going to make a call to the routing service to get all possible routes from the user's current location to the destination along with the ETA, so the time it's going to take the user to actually reach the destination. After that, the navigation service with that list of routes, it's going to call the ranking service so that the ranking service can rank the routes according to how long it's going to take and also filter out any routes that does not align with the user's preference. At this point, the navigation service should have a list of curated routes that the user can take, and it's going to send that as a HTTP response to the original, uh, original request in step one. A few things to note from this diagram is uh, to actually uh, compute the routes from, from A to B, uh, we are going to use some variation of either a dextrous or a star algorithm. Most of the routes should be pre-computed already so that the routing service does not have to actually come up with the route on the fly. It should be able to look up somewhere and get the routes very, very quickly. And for the more common routes that user takes more often, we can just cache them somewhere so that it's even faster for the routing service uh, if a user is taking one of the more common routes. Now let's say the user got the list and they picked one of the route and they start driving or just walking towards the destination. Now, of course, we need to get the location updates from the user to be able to give them directions when appropriate. Every 10 to 15 seconds, the client, which is going to be the user's phone, is going to make an API call to update the user's location data. In this diagram, you can see the user's phone is sending the latitude and longitude of the user every 10 seconds to the location service. And the location service is storing it in a database, in this case, Cassandra. We're going to talk about why Cassandra in a second. So the steps, client sends location updates to the server using HTTP. So this connection over here, this is just a simple TCP connection and the request is just a HTTP request. As the user is moving around, the client should also be able to update the location of the user in the map so that the user can actually see themselves moving on the map. 
Now let's talk about why we're using Cassandra here as opposed to any other database. If you think about the application, the, every user is sending their location updates 10 to 15 seconds, right? So that's a lot of writes coming to the database. So of course the application is gonna have an extremely high write throughput. Also, if you think about it, every user is doing this. So on a given day, there's gonna be thousands and thousands of user going to different places, right? So the volume of data is gonna increase very, very quickly. And we need a database that can scale horizontally as this data is increasing over time. If you saw some of the previous videos, you should be aware that for use cases like these, Cassandra tends to be a very clear choice. And that's why we're gonna go with Cassandra over here too. Now, let's talk about the schema of the Cassandra table. Of course, I'm gonna keep this very simple. In a, in a practical application, you will have more columns, but I'm just gonna add three columns, the user ID, the timestamp, and the location to give you an idea about how the schema can look like. So our primary key in this table is gonna be the user ID and timestamp. So it's gonna be a compound primary key. Uh, in that primary key, our partition key is gonna be the user ID. So every Cassandra partition is gonna have all the data related to one user. And the timestamp at that point becomes a clustering key. And we're gonna order that in descending order so that the most recent timestamp is at the top of the table or at the top of the partition. What this is gonna mean is every partition has all the data of a given user. And given it's sorted by timestamp in descending order, that means the first row in every partition is gonna be the most recent location of the user. That means it should be very, very easy to get the most recent location of a user whenever you're querying Cassandra. Okay, now that we have a system in place to get real-time location updates from the user and actually store the data or the location data in the Cassandra table, let's see how we can use the location data to optimize the system even more. So I'm gonna zoom in one more level, there you go. So you already saw the first part of this diagram. So the user is sending their location every 10 seconds. The location service is storing that location information in the Cassandra table. Now there are gonna be multiple other systems or services in your architecture that are gonna find location data very, very helpful. So we need a way for these services to get the location data in real time too. We can use Kafka to do that. So if you remember, uh, most databases have some kind of a change data capture system or a CDC system. What that means is every time there is any change to the data in the database, we can write a message into a Kafka topic. So that can mean any new, any new row being inserted into the database, any row being deleted or just updated. But for every change in the data, so in the Cassandra table, we are gonna be writing a message into a Kafka topic. Now that Kafka topic can be consumed by all the different services that needs to know about the location data in real time. In this example, I have the traffic service, the environment service, and the ETA service. All three of them to optimize their algorithms and their data they need to know about this location data in real time. So what they're doing is they're subscribing to that CDC Kafka topic. And what that does is whenever Cassandra is pushing the database changes into Kafka, all the services that are consuming from that topic, they are gonna be notified about the new location data almost immediately. Okay, and now this location data can be used to optimize everything else in real time, especially things like traffic conditions and ETA that the user for the user. So yeah, uh, if you have a new service that also needs location data, you can just create that service and make it a consumer of the same Kafka topic that these three services are consuming from. 
Okay, so we are going to move on to the last thing, which is going to be pushing real-time updates to the client uh, whenever there is evolving road conditions or traffic conditions. As the user is moving, things can change very quickly. A examples would be there can be accidents on the way, there can be evolving road conditions, or the ETA of the user might change very drastically. In all these cases, we need a way to push update from the server to the client. So from the server to the user's phone. And this is sort of a system we can use to do that. To push any real-time changes from server to client, we need some kind of a persistent connection between the client and the server. In this case, we're gonna use WebSocket. We can also use HTTP long polling, but that might add some delay or latency to the update being sent to the client. So to make it more real time, we are gonna go with the WebSocket connection. So by the nature of a WebSocket connection, not only can the client push data to the server, but the server can also push data to the client. So it's a bi-directional connection where data can flow both directions. Once the WebSocket connection has been, uh, cr has been created between the client and the server, all the information related to that connection can go to either a DynamoDB table or a Redis database or cache. The reason Redis can work here is most of these WebSocket connections, they are not gonna last forever. They're only gonna last for the duration of the user's trip. So we can afford to store them in some less persistent data stores such as Redis. But if you do want a persistent database, you can use DynamoDB to store these data. Whenever there's any updates to traffic condition, road condition, or ETA, these can be sent to the real-time service using some kind of a HTTP call or some kind of an asynchronous system based on Kafka. Now the real-time service should know which users to send this update to. They can get the information related to WebSocket connections with every user from the DynamoDB table, and then it can push those updates to the user's phone using that WebSocket connection. What this means is whenever there is a, any kind of event that the user should be notified about, the real-time service should be able to easily do that through that WebSocket connection. All right, I think I have covered everything I wanted to. So hopefully this was helpful and gives you an idea about how to design navigation services. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. With that being said, I hope you guys have a good rest of the day and I'm gonna catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.